hello, global audience. Welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries. We do 20 minutes of conversation, then 20 minutes of answering questions from you, the global audience. I am Liz Hinline, the creative director at New York Film Academy, as well as a filmmaker. And I am so beyond pleased and excited to present the legendary comedian, actor, entertainer, Joe Piscopo. Hello, Joe. Hi, Liz. So nice, so nice to see you. I'm honored to be here. Oh, we're so thrilled to have you. So I'm really curious. You have such a distinct style and such a distinct voice. How did you find your voice as a talent and as, as a comedian actor? You know, it's instinctive. A uh, very interesting question, Liz, is uh, because when I was in high school, you know, I wanted to do the rock and roll thing. So I had the band, you know, I was, I was coming up in high school in the 60s, you know, with Jimi Hendrix and Eric Burden and the Animals and, and the British Invasion and everything. So we used to play. But then I always wanted to get on stage. I was terrible at school. Hard to imagine, I know. But I was just, I was just not an academic uh, nor an intellectual. So, but on stage, I just felt comfortable. And I would be like, I was a discipline problem. But on stage, I was so scared that I had to learn the words. To observe, you know, absorb the script and then execute it in front of, you know, hundreds of people. That straightened me out. I always say drama. And my coach, Charles E. Gaunt, rest his soul, you know, he was a, a, a very distinguished, talented actor in his own right. He was our mentor. And that really saved me. And I just found myself in high school. And then I was very fortunate to receive the Lincoln Center Student Arts Award where they picked three students from the school and a couple of the other from the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And I got to go to Lincoln Center as a kid and I got to see Lee J. Cobb and King Lear. How about that? And I was like, wow, I was just blown away. And then I, I went to, uh, so anyway, I found it there in, 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 in high school. I really found it there. Uh, but then as I, I'm telling you, there's one thing about our craft, Liz, is you discover something new every day. Yeah, and you or at the end of each day, even now I go, wow, I wish I knew that 25 years ago. You know, but it was in high school where I really my heart where I really fell in love with uh, performing. And then and then tell me about comedy because that is so I would think a terrifying and ha and and did you come from a funny family? Like where does where does the humor come from? Yeah. My great, my father was very funny. Always, everything was funny to dad, no matter what. I mean, I remember a time, and I won't get into it now, but he got shot, literally shot. It was like a crazy guy back in the 60s. Thank God he, he made it. You know, he was a World War II veteran, you know, served in Italy in the Second World War. And he's joking around. You know, like I see the bullet here, got the bullet. And he was, thank God he was good, but he always had a sense of humor. And that is the way to deal with it. Even with the crazy politics of today, it's always, I always deal with it with a sense of humor. You know, but, um, and I, I don't want to keep going on, but when I got out of, I went to college, my father insisted I go to college. And so I went to college and I studied radio and television in college. And I mm -hmm. graduated with a degree then. Then after college, I went into a catatonic stupor for about two years. So I was doing odd jobs, you know. I didn't know what, I said, I still felt the lure of the stage. When I, mm -hmm. I, said, I tried radio. I tried, uh, you know, do, I got a television offer down in Jacksonville, Florida, where I went to school. And I said, I got to try comedy. And, and, I, and then they were doing the improvs, late 70s. And, and for, probably before most of the audience, and certainly you were born. But I was like, I, I went to the Improvisation Comedy Club, 44th and 9th, in a place they called Hell's Kitchen in New York. And it was dangerous then. It was, it would be, it was, Crime was rampant, and you used to. I, Larry David was there, Jerry Seinfeld was there, uh, um, Rodney Dangerfield would come in, the great Rodney Dangerfield. Hey, how are you? How are you? How you doing? Good to see you. Hey, Rodney. And, and with Rodney Dangerfield, you know, Robert Klein and Robin Williams was just breaking, you know. And I was a kid, man. I was on, and I was going, and I had to go up, and you have to do five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I go, okay, I gotta try to do this, I gotta try to to do get onto the stage in New York City. So it was a Sunday night, they had an audition night, and I drove in my car from New Jersey, and I went to the Lincoln Tunnel, and then I went by the club list. There were like four or 500 people outside waiting to get in, just to audition for a spot. 
And I looked at my car, I went, wow. I kept going, I went right back in the Lincoln Tunnel. I went right back home, man. The, the next week, you wanna talk about dedication, the next week we went in, we had to be there at 12 noon on Sunday and wait virtually eight hours online to get the right number. And you wanted number three or four, you didn't want number one because that was audition night, it was jam packed. And I always say, uh, Liz, that a film was never made about that era where I would be on stage and and uh, and and then the greatest star, Richard Pryor, would walk in for crying out loud. You would see and just explode the room. And we were just trying to make it. But once I hit that audition, and I did it for about six weeks, and then they made me a regular, which meant I got to get up before four people at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know? And that was my break. And I said, look, I'm going to do this. And I stayed with it. And I was there almost four and a half years before Saturday Night Live. And sure enough, within the first six months, an agent came in, saw me on stage. I started doing commercials. I started working. I was a working actor and I was in my glory, you know, but, but you're right about, to this day, I go back to that club, I'm still terrified. I got the same feeling I had from the first day I walked in the door, absolutely. And so what, what, what was the sort of, what were you writing? What type of what, what would type of comedian would they call you? Let's say, you know, uh, observational comedy. You know, where hey, you know what happened today, and you tell a story that happened today, or I tell about uh, the issues of the day, uh, uh, politics. You know, uh, what came in? Jimmy Carter was in in office, so we joked about Jimmy Carter. We we talked about uh, you know having to turn off the lights at Christmas time, the same energy, like that sort of thing. And then I was. I always felt comfortable improvising. So I'd be on stage, at the, then they, they made me the master of ceremonies. So I said, okay, so I'm on stage and I'm introducing people. Now we had a, uh, an exit door at the old improv. It was like a fire exit right to the right of the stage. So sometimes people, stars would knock on the door. I wouldn't know who they were. And it was great, it was like a bit. So there was my strength, I think, mm -hmm. where I just would say the do door knock and I would go, hey, Looks like somebody had, let's who's at the door. So I'd walk out the microphone and Robin Williams walks in. Andy Kaufman walks in. Come on. And I'm on stage. And then and Robin, by the way, rest his soul, one of the greatest entertainers of all time, one of the most giving performers. And I've worked, I'm old. I've worked with everybody. I've worked with Jerry Lewis. I've worked with all the greats, Don Rickles. Robin, one of the most giving performers. You know, it's interesting that someone that brilliant would be that giving. Mm -hmm. And Robin would, he, he'd do a bit, then he'd step back and let you go in, you know? And, he was, and there I was on, and then Andy Kaufman as well, sweetheart, rest his soul. Uh, Andy Kaufman, he, it was so, I, I was at sea with all these stars. And then you get a call, Rodney's coming in. And then Bette Midler would, would come in and jam at the piano. What, a, what an era, what a way to be brought up, you know? And, and uh, it was mostly improvisation, mostly ob observational, but it was a great showcase for me because that's how people saw you, that's how you got jobs. Saturday Night Live, they were looking for a new, new cast members, mm -hmm. and it was a writer from the improvisation who talked to the producer at Saturday Night Live, and that's how I got in there. But you know what? Working on stage live, like I always admired Second City. I always admired those improvisational groups. I always admired those live performance. There's nothing like live. To this day, I'm on the radio every morning, but I'll tell you what, I live for live. I'm a live performer. And that, you know what, to, to the point we were making, Liz? Mm -hmm. Like, I think I realized that just a few years ago. Uh, I'm a live guy. It's where my comfort zone is. Uh, you could just be as nervous as you're going to be before you get on stage. When you're on stage, you're, you're, you're most comfortable there than anywhere else in life. It's, uh, and I think that is either uh, a disease, you know, or it's, or it's just something that is innate in your chemical makeup as a person. Either You're either there or you're not. And apparently I'm there because I'm still on the road every weekend. That's amazing. That is so amazing. And so did you do any type of like education or classes or training? Or is this all natural talent that you just shot out of the cannon with? Yeah. You're a good interviewer, Liz. Liz was on my, in case you're watching, Liz was on my radio show yesterday. You, you were great on the radio, by the way. But this is a great question. No, I, I, went, I went to a couple acting classes you know, I, I went to a singing class once and I chose to do my voice, you know, and I, and I started singing like Frank Sinatra, you know, 
And I'm saying, like, you know, I'm doing like, fly me to the moon. Let me swing among the stars. And the teacher say, you can't sound like Frank Sinatra. You'll never make a living sounding like Frank Sinatra. And she told me that, really. So, and I, then I would go to class and I would just get antsy in class. I just wanted to get up. And then, I, and then when you, I always have admired, I always had admiration for actors like uh, the great actors of my generation, like Al Pacino or Dustin Hoffman, you know, or Bobby De Niro. These, they had to go through, when they started out, hundreds of auditions, hundreds of people, you know? I felt more comfortable saying, give me the mic, give me the stage, and I will, and you gotta think this in your head as a performer, I will own it, but I won't have anybody else, it'll just be me. And I felt more comfortable that in that regard. You know, although when we went to Saturday Night Live, you learned ensemble fast and on the fly and really in, in the belly of the beast, you know, spur of the moment. So that was something that I learned on SNL, uh, remarkably enough. And and ensemble, tell me about how, how does one, like, how do you, you know, uh, work with ensemble? Because it seems like there could also be com competition. There could be some <clears throat> real weird politics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So... I think, did I learn, probably learn from Robin Williams, because again, this is a man I have immense respect for, and then he would give, he would give you a little bit on stage, you know? Uh, uh, other. What does that mean he would give you a little bit? Like, what does that look like? He could go in rapid fire delivery, where he would do laugh after laugh after laugh and build it, bum, 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 and he'll take, literally take a step back and look, and look to you, and that is your opening to go in, mm -hmm. you know? And I remember, being on Saturday Night Live and the ensemble of SNL with, with the great cast. And I was I always had the privilege of being with the great Eddie Murphy. We came up together and Eddie was 19 years old and truly like Robin, a comic genius. You know, I, I always con consider myself a working entertainer, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, feel, I felt confident I could hold my own, but I'm a working entertainer. These guys are like in, in another universe. In, they are, Eddie is just a brilliant comic genius. He was the guy too. I noticed from Eddie, he would do his bits, he would do his voices, he would go into the camera, and then he would wait. And that was your that was your cue. It was a rhythm. And I think people always go, Joe, you and Eddie work so well on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, I think it's respect and it's a rhythm. Because I don't want to mention names. Because I'm not that kind of person. But I've worked with people that try to your point that try to hog the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, get get and you're trying to and you want and there's no rhythm. It just you, when you're on stage, or if I'm in the master ceremonies, you're trying to, it, your job is to make sure that audience walks out on. Did you see that was awesome? You want the audience to say that. And if it takes you getting back, if it takes you giving the laugh to somebody else, then it's your job to make the show great. You are a team member. So that's the difference between ensemble and certainly doing it yourself, you know? When you, what, what was your audition for Saturday Night Live like? Oh, oh. so. Long story short, I'm at the improv, they do a sweep. NBC does a sweep, they're replacing this Saturday Night Live. Now, I'd be at the comedy clubs, and I remember John Belushi would walk in. And I had no idea, because we were working Saturday nights. I didn't even know. I heard about the show, didn't know. I'm at the bar at a Catch Rising Star, we're waiting to go on stage. And I go, hey, how you doing? And some guy goes, hey, how you doing? I said, what's your name? He goes, hey, I'm John Belushi. I go, hey, how you doing? I remember, this is my, fr this is my friend Danny Aykroyd. I swear to God, I go, I go hi, fellas, how you doing? You going on stage? And uh, now nah, we're doing this new show in town. I go, what's the show? Saturday Night Live. I said, cool. Oh, let's go. And then who knew, you know, like about five years later, uh, they, they were going to get rid of everybody else. I don't know why they did it. And they were going to bring in a new cast. So that's where my friend, my writer friend goes, Joe, you should go up. They need a utility guy because I was doing impressions. And what does utility guy mean? If you utility guy means if the sketch doesn't work, call the utility guy. He'll make it work. The utility guy is, this is a really bad sketch, and we can't what, get the utility guy, just throw it at him, and you're just the fill-in guy, you know? Like, you're the safety net of the, of the sketch. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so and, and you do impressions. Like, like, Dan Aykroyd was the utility guy. Dan Aykroyd was really the captain of the SNL starship. I'll tell you that right now, for all generations. Danny's the guy. Danny, Canada's best, man, I'll tell you what. He was great, but... But he was like the safety net. So, so I went up and I did a, a quick audition for the producer. And they said, okay, uh, we want you to audition on camera in what was uh, Dave Letterman's studio. 
on the uh, third floor, I think it was. And, and so I went and I, I must have bypassed a lot of auditions because I was there and there weren't too many of us, maybe 25, 30 of us, finalists of SNL. Liz, I didn't even want the job. You couldn't replace the original Saturday Night Live. Gilda Radner, Billy Murray, Chevy, Danny, John, and Lorraine Newman. You can't, you Chevy, you couldn't replace. I, I don't want this job. My agent kept saying, you got to go to the audition. You got to go. So then I went and they put the camera up and I just did the comedy I was doing on stage. And then I did the Frank Sinatra impression. You know, I don't stand the ghost of a chance with you. You know, and they said, wow, this guy's doing the Sinatra. This is wild. And I get the job. And I got the job. And I'm going like, I don't know how he did it. And then I went in, and, and, and I don't want to be too long-winded here, but this was, this was interesting, I think. Go upstairs to the 17th floor office. And there's a young kid, and they go, oh, this kid from Long Island's here. I said, what's his name? Eddie Murphy. So I, I, did, I didn't hear Eddie. You, all the comics usually knew each other, and I didn't hear Eddie. So I, so I went over there and I said, hey, man, so how you doing? Joe Biscuit Club. He goes, hey, I'm Eddie. Right there, I, I, I hope Eddie felt the same way, because it was a, 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 just a, a link up, an attachment of emotion, and a bonding that you felt. But I think everybody feels that way when they meet Eddie. And hopefully myself a little bit because he he was it was so down to earth. And here is this kid. Now they weren't going to hire him at SNL that day because they thought he was too edgy. He was too edgy. So we went on a, a campaign. I went into the studio with the with the producer, me and Eddie, and the writers, and we did a sketch Chevy Chase and Richard Pryor did called Word Association. Mm -hmm. And I I couldn't even tell you about it now because it was so inappropriate, so politically incorrect. Oh my gosh. It was, I couldn't even tell you now because we would get in trouble if I talked about it now. Using certain words. You know, and, and if you watch the Chevy Chase Richard Pryor sketch on SNL, you see, we did that. I saw Eddie just explode in that room. And as he's doing, I looked at him, I said to myself, this is the next Richard Pryor. You know, this is the next great comic. I knew it right there. So they put him on and, and then we got to work and by the grace of God, it just worked out. But it wasn't easy. It was very, very tough. We went through some bumps. Because but because you can't replace what Lauren Michaels built, you know. But uh, we tried to just follow the path, and 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 again, by the grace of God, it worked out. Did you have you had mentors along the line, along the way? Yeah, you know what a great question. Uh, you know, I just had to think. I don't know that I did in the performance arena. Oh, my mentor in high school, my drama coach in high school. You know, they, they those high school coaches will leave a coach, you know, the drama coach will leave an indelible mark on you. But when I got out, the mentor, now I would look, you would always talk to somebody uh, or observe somebody, uh, a comic, uh, like Robert Klein, who, who came out of college, uh, for example, not so much a mentor as someone you admire. And Robert, we when Robert Klein came to the club, he was educated. And they said, wow, you went to school, you mean? Because no one went to school. Every, I went, I graduated college, but a lot of folks just, they were out of high school. That Eddie was 19. He just went right on the clubs, you know, and, and Robert climbed to Yale and he was funny. I went, wow. So, but I watched him work and then you watch him on stage. And those really were your mentors. Uh, Johnny Carson on television, when you got the chance to do the Johnny Carson show, those are your mentors, you know? And then I was very, very blessed. And I have to tell you, I think Danny Aykroyd was a mentor that, that you mentioned it because I watched his demeanor, his portrayal, his execution of characters with not a lot of makeup, by the way, on SNL. Mm -hmm. And then there were great writers, Michael O'Donohue, but uh, mostly Alan Zweibel is live to this day, one of the most revered writers of Saturday Night Live. So I stayed close to those folks and maybe in some way I was mentored, you know, by just being around them. If, if, if that makes any sense. And how have you seen like the comedian, the, the comic entertainment change over the years of that? Well, <laughs> I'm kind of biased because I have such love for Eddie, you know, and then I don't think before or since I'll say this, and I know there's some great comics out there. You can't touch Eddie on stage, man. You just can't touch it. When you watch Eddie and you say, well, I, again, I'm totally biased because I came up with him. Okay, so I understand. Oh, Joe, what about, okay, okay, I got it, I got it, like that. But I, I just, well, I don't, it's interesting because I'm an old-fashioned guy, 
And when I started out, you asked about material, we would go into the gutter. We would use foul language. It was right after Lenny Bruce. So we figure, hey, Lenny Bruce can do it. We can do it, can't we? And I would, and then people would say, Joe, you don't need it. You don't need to use it. So I've, to this day, I'm very clean on stage, clean on stage. Eddie, not so much. You know, so so it was so the difference. But Eddie was, I would say, why do you why are you using vulgar language? I say, Eddie would go, because they're laughing. And I could, I didn't have an argument for him, you know. But Eddie was funny when he did it. He used that profanity, and it was hysterical. Now it's a crutch a bit. It's a crutch. And I, hey, when I started out, I used it as a crutch. You know, you use, you drop an F bomb. Oh, 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 and that's that. If that accentuates the joke, the joke isn't worthy. I'm, I'm like one of those. I, I would watch Jerry Seinfeld and go, wow, look at this guy's brilliant. Look at Jerry. Not a, not a inappropriate word out of his mouth. And he's funnier than, you know, anybody, you know? And, and so, so I think, I, I, not to sound old fashioned, but I like it clean. I like it, you know, character driven. And, 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 and I don't like, you don't have to lean on any of that shock value. Just give it to me fun. Just out of curiosity, when you were on SNL and there was a guest star, a guest rock band, was, who was it that just blew your mind? James Brown. James Brown. Why? He was a social warrior of the 60s. And, and not to get too heavy, but I went through the uh, riots in my parents' hometown in Newark, New Jersey, and we saw Newark burn down. And uh, it, it led to me mentoring at-risk youth today and, and, and being the spokesperson for the Boys and Girls Club. I saw, I saw what happened in, you know, my parents' old neighborhood. So all the, all the politicians came out lists, all the, the social justice warriors of the day. You know who kept the peace back then? And I remember distinctly as a kid, I was in like 10th grade, it, James Brown. He was on stage in Boston. And it started to get crazy because they heard Newark burned down, Plainfield, New Jersey. Uh, Chicago was gone. Detroit, but the city started, the America started to burn. Jeans got up, he said, we're all in this together. Everybody's staying down. He had the police on stage with him. People rushed the stage. He said to the police, I got this. I got this, let these folks be. The, it see, and it maybe because I was young and maybe I have a overblown uh, perception of this, but James kept the peace. It was James Brown. Then cut to 1984, 19, whenever it was, who's the music guest at Saturday Night Live? James Brown. I said, James is doing the show, man. That's my old time. I, are you kidding me? So James, I'm in the back. And now I got to meet James. If you do, if you, if you, you're the music guest at SNL, you come in and you come out. Like James said, you hit it and you quit. You go in, you go out because you, you, you're, you're there just for a day and you really don't get to hang with the music guest. Mm -hmm. I was going to meet James Brown. So, so I was in the back of the room, end of the show. James does a set. Liz, no one ripped up Studio 8H at NBC like James. Nobody. Not you 2 not the Stones, not Aretha, respect to them all. James rocked that room to this day like I've never seen. I was, I was like, I had chills, man, watching this guy work, you know? Then I watch him, and he's on stage. And now, now I stalk him. Listen, now I stalk him. He's walking off the stage. We go to commercial break, and I'm going around the other way to, to take a shortcut to the guest star, music star dressing room, right? So I get to the door, the door shuts just as I get there. I go, what? So I knock on the door, and I got to knock on the door, and a big body guard, you know, opens the door. He does this with his head, like, what are you doing? I go, uh, I'm a new cast member, and I'm, I'm, I idolize James. Can I, can I see him? Closes the door, and I go, oh, I hope I didn't make a fool of myself. The door slowly opens again, and the guard steps away, and there's my hero, James Brown, glistening with sweat. He had, a, he had the cape on, the outfit on, and he just looked up at me, and I walked over and I said, Mr. Brown, Joe Piscopo, I have a new cast member on, us, on the show, and uh, I got to tell you, I'm your biggest fan, man. And he was, and the joke I do on stage, James talked like he sang, you know, I didn't care, I didn't care, hey, hey! He was James, I am proud to tell you, I became a friend of James Brown. He would go and do events, and I would see James. I don't know that I ever understood anything he said, but I tell you what, that he was James Brown. And to this day, and you know what I did? Cut to this day, like I'm, I'm redoing like a little music dungeon I have downstairs at the house here, and I got pictures of Frank Sinatra, Jimi Hendrix, who I also admire, a Buddy Rich on the drums, you know, Gene Krupa, Eric Burton from the Animals, and I just ordered from Portugal, Liz, 
a big wall decal of who? James Brown. That's and I'm going to put it right there. It's a life-size picture of James. He was a sweetheart of a guy, the hardest worker man in show business. And that left the, re and you know what it did? As a performer, no matter what genre you're performing in, nobody worked harder than James. And I, I observed that when I saw him in person. That, that, wow. that, that's my man right there. Great story. That's a great story. And also like, you know, I love the idea that you don't need to have a physical mentor, someone telling you what to do yeah. to actually really learn, but it's by watching those who have come before you. Exactly. I would watch that. I was fortunate enough to work with, honestly, you know, Jerry Lewis, who was a, a really true genius. Jerry was. Mm -hmm. And you watch his early films, Nutty Professor, and you, you could watch a, a cinder fella and his writing. I show him to my kids today. I had my young kids and I showed Jerry, very Chaplin-esque, you know, but observing the movement of those folks, even the great Don Rickles, the comedian, the American comedian, Don Rickles, rest his soul, was very, I learned from these folks, you know, but in, in my generation, it was Dan Aykroyd's patience and resolve mm -hmm. to execute a character that probably influenced me most, because he wasn't using makeup. I used, a lot, I used prosthetics on SNL. We would put, I had a brilliant makeup guy, Kevin Haney, and he would put, then I'd talk Eddie into it. Eddie goes, I'm not wearing makeup. I said, Eddie, no, you got to do it. And then I, I'm the guy that talked Eddie into doing prosthetics, and he did a, a killer Muhammad Ali. Eddie did. Oh, it was great. And I could tell you stories where I was on a plane with Eddie going to L.A., and Muhammad Ali happened to be on the plane, and I see Eddie, he goes, oh, my God, what? I saw the look of it. He goes, Muhammad Ali's on the plane. We got to hang out with Ali on a plane. So by the grace of God, it's been a wild, wild journey, you know, but your point is so well taken. If you observe and your, your ego is such that you don't want to command, you just, you can learn, you absorb it and it'll just make you a better performer. I think. That's amazing. That's amazing, Joe. So we're going to go to some questions from our audience. Um, Prince Mensa says, how do you come up with your jokes and how do you feel if the, audi if the audience doesn't laugh at your jokes? Yeah, well, you come up with the jokes by your observations in the, in the, in, of the day, of, of the day, you know, and you could do a, I always like to do satires of something, you know, whether if it was uh, uh, like I always wanted to do a, a rap song. I said, well, what am I doing a rap? So I did a white boy rap, you know, where I was the white guy rapping about being a white guy. So you know, either folks, time to get down, got to get the funky feeling of the white boy sound, you know, and, and, and it kind of works. So that was like uh, an, ob an observation of me being a little bit dorky, but trying to be hip. So I use that as, as material. I stepped on stage, my first big time uh, uh, on stage at the improv, big time for me, was uh, two o'clock in the morning, and it was check spot. No one likes a check spot because everybody gets a check. And then people are looking going, hey, nothing's this funny. This is 400 bucks, you know, whatever it is, you know. So you got to work harder when the check spot there. They screw me on stage. Piscopo, you're on like that. And I got up on stage and I wasn't doing great. I was trying the material. Hey, Joe, go down the street, walk the dog, doing something. And then, you know what? Someone said something in the crowd. I can't remember. And I go, yeah, what do you do, pal? Boom. I went right to him. Laser <laughs> <laughs> right to him. Yeah, nice. Okay. And you and you're gonna get on my case. So what you guys I went, I did 15 minutes of improvisation. If it doesn't work, go into the crowd. Get right into the crowd. To this day, it's, and it's a great question because to this day, you'll go out and if it's a corporate crowd and everybody's kind of a little stiff, uh, man, I, I don't stop working until I go in there and I reach it, I grab that crowd and I take it home. You know, so if it's not working. Go to the audience, you know, it, it, it seems to work and they love it. They love it because they get exactly what's going on. Totally. The interaction, but also you're being a present as an actor and you're seeing yeah. what, what you've been given. You're given yeah. circumstances. Exactly. Survival too. was survival, right? Exactly. Um, Katie Tupin asks, what were some of the things early on that were outside of your comfort zone that you had to practice and work on? Yeah. Oh, God, these are great questions. When they handed me a sketch on Saturday Night Live, and I would be embarrassed to do it because the sketch wasn't great. And so, like, there was one sketch where I was with Don Rickles, the great Don Rickles, and it was the sketch, it was the first sketch that you do the cold opening, you do the monologue, I guess monologue, right? And then you go into that first sketch. If that first sketch, after, after the monologue, doesn't work, the show can tank on SNL. You gotta hit it right early on. Eddie wasn't on that week. He was shooting uh, 
uh, 48 hours. So they said, Joe, it's on you. You know, I learned, oh, okay, no pressure. You know, yeah. and Rickles was on. So we start doing a sketch. Jimmy Belushi's in the sketch and, and my friend Gary Kroger. And, and it was about, Rickles was in a witness protection program and we were the cops trying to protect them. It just, it was, and it wasn't working. It, and it wasn't, and I'm going on. Oh, so I, now, what am I gonna do? Now I'm with the great Rickles. So I had a, 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 a speech that I had to deliver to Don in a staccato kind of delivery, one word after another, and, and I went and I, I nailed him with the speech in his face and slapped him in the face every time I said a word. And don't forget it. <laughs> and I said, and Rickles, being the comic genius, hit, boom, he go, boom, boom. And he had a hat on, I took his hat, I put it over his head, and the camera was behind me shooting like this. I put my hand over his mouth and I kissed him, looked like I kissed him like this. And I pulled away, no one knew he do. He rolled his eyes up, did a crack fall, boom, we were off and running. And it worked. And that was just survival. Talking about being out of your comfort zone. I said, oh, God, I'm going to kill. The whole show could have died. So you, you, it's, a, it's a matter of survival. It really is. You're out of your comfort zone. That's when you find out if you got it or not. And by the grace of God, that, thanks to the, the genius of Don Rickles, we, we got it. You can see it online if you go to Rickles Piscopo on SNL. Uh, the witness protection sketch is hysterical. To this day, I can't believe I got away. Listen, I got away with it. I don't know how I did it. And did you did you ever practice or learn physical comedy like Steve Martin or that sort of like the falls and the yeah no, and the stairs and Jerry Lewis I learned a lot of that yeah and so it was uh, but I didn't and on stage I, I would like to do a lot of the physicality even to this day I'm on stage a lot of very physical on stage where, and I do a lot of music instruments I'm either playing the drums or uh, we're playing guitar or if I'm doing the old man you find yourself getting at the physicality of it. The physical, um, uh, when you would take, observe uh, and, and absorb the physicality is when you would do a character. So if you're doing, if you're doing Frank Sinatra, my sh I feel my shoulders go back. I feel you could almost, you just gotta think of it. You just absorb, channel it. You have to virtually channel it like that. Or when I did, um, I did uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, where uh, Reagan was just, uh, well, uh, yeah, he well, Joe, you know, and it was always with that kind of uh, attitude, and and it, the, the physicality came from you knowing the character. Jerry Lewis was that, and again, I forgive the old reference, but if you watch some Jerry stuff, it was pretty funny, and he was just, he was physical, crazy. So I learned from him doing that, uh, just being active on stage. I don't like between us, I, it just us. Yeah. I, I don't like when a comic is just there, you know, and unless you're Jerry Seinfeld and brilliant like Jerry is. You better keep dancing because you know you got you got to keep the crowd. And Jerry's up there going, "Lady, you know, hi. You know, move all around this guy. Oh, hi, hi. And you just keep dancing, and that's where the physicality came in from watching watching the greats. You know, just trying to maintain the crowd. It is just amazing watching because your face totally does morph. It really transforms. That is that is such craft and such genius oh. to be able to do that like off the cuff. And, oh, try, trying, it, it was interesting. On, on SNL doing the impressions, we had, used to have to study it and I would have to study it. And they made me do Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. I said, how am I gonna do Jimmy Carter? And then Dan Aykroyd does a television personality uh, called, he was Tom Snyder was his name. And he was a great, a great guy, great, great broadcaster, but he was very, very animated. And Danny did uh, uh, Tom Snyder. You know, good morning, everybody. And he always had this laugh. <laughs> hey, I'd like to talk to you this morning. That is like the big Tom Snyder. So now they go, Joe, you got to do, after Danny left, you're doing Tom Snyder. I go, I, I'm not following Dan Aykroyd's Tom Snyder. How can I possibly do it? But this is talking about comfort zone. The bosses, the producers, you're doing Tom Snyder. And you got to be a good soldier. And I was. So I did, I did a Spanish Tom Snyder. I did a mock span. I just turned the whole thing around, brought it to, to myself, and again, somehow, somehow, by a miracle, it worked. But, um, we have a question. Uh, do you think the, the comedian actor should be doing dramatic characters as well? Yeah, that's a, another great question. You know what? I really feel all comics are great actors. And I, and I think people become comics to mask the pain. I think I became 
I, I, I'm not really a comedian. I just back into it, like I told you, on stage. When I got on stage and I was just, I, all I wanted to be was a working, and all you want to be is a working actor. Mm -hmm. That's all you want to be. If you're working, you made it. You made the big time. If you get a job, you made the big time like that. But if, uh, but, uh, but it, 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 as, I, as I see myself try to be funny, you want to be funny, you will crack the jokes, you're masking the pain within yourself. It's great therapy. If really, if I didn't play the drums on stage or I didn't entertain, you know, I, I, I don't know where I would be right now, you know, because, and then I found out when I started doing, uh, uh, I did Wise Guys, the film with Brian De Palma and Danny DeVito, and I had to do some drama scenes. And I felt comfortable doing it and I was not trained. And then when I got on, I did uh, Law and Order in America, we did Law and Order, that, one of the great shows in all of television's history. And all the actors, Sam Waterston and, and the great uh, Jerry Orbach, the late great Jerry Orbach, you, you walked on, you had to learn your words. And then you step on in front of the camera and they'd have like three. And back when I started, they had 35 millimeter cameras. And with a crew, the best of New York, you had to know your words and you, and you couldn't. And when I started doing my first Law and Order, it was bigger. It was Broadway. It was, and, and the director came over and went like this, Joe, I need this, like that. So I took whatever training I had, I listened to the director, and I brought it right down here, where you just, and that's film. That is film, and that's that. And, and I learned, even as a comic, that I, that I felt so comfortable doing the drama. So, and I don't know what it is. Look at Eddie. Eddie, Eddie's a great actor. Eddie Murphy's a great actor, you know? And he had, by the way, just as an aside, and I only use Eddie as an analogy because I came up with him, you know? And when I remember we were on Saturday Night Live, he said, hey, I did this film 48 hours. I want you to see it, you know? I'm okay. And I watched him. I'll say the patience Eddie had at 19 years old on film is, uh, no one talks about it. The patience, the patience. When they say action, you want to get to your words. You, you want to just to lay back, say your words. And, you, and I think comics have that natural gift. It's just from all that time on stage. It's got to be this. You know, even Jerry Lewis, great actor, great actor when he's serious, you know? Uh, Jim Carrey, all these, all these great, these comics. I mean, look at when you talk to uh, uh, Jamie Foxx doing a, a, a Ray. Do you see that? You, I mean, can you think of a better performance? I mean, look at Will Smith. Will Smith, he's on The Prince of Bel Air. This is one of the great actors of our time. I don't care what you say. He's he could just and and there's guys with really kind of comic backgrounds, and I, I think it all has to do with pain, <laughs> you know, geez, drawn from within. And I didn't learn that till I went through my second divorce. <laughs> no, we won't all have to go to that pain school, right? Maybe it unearthed the pain that was there because, uh -huh. um, and you needed to go through it. But it's interesting because it seems to me that the improv creates uh, the ability to listen. And then the ability to listen is that you can be in your role, listen, and then make so total sense that comedians will make amazing actors. Yeah, that's a, a great idea. Great observation. That's exactly right. It took and it took me years. You, you, if you listen, they, they, like if you go, you learn your words, and then the set is ready, and and your makeup is on, and you've got to leave that script, and you got to go, and you're on your own, and you don't have like a television show, you know, prompters. You're on your own, and everything. You want to know. You want to just be. It, you want to. If you just put every. I found this out myself. You put everything else aside that all the cameras the director were all, were all that anxiety all that noise go right into the scene i learned that on law and order actually, i learned that i learned that doing the television show because i was just get because like i would be before i was doing a scene with sam waters and i had a speech at the end of law and order and it was the end of the day and it was friday and the crew couldn't wait to get home i mean they've been all week so they said all right we're going to turn it around we're on joe and I said, what, Joe, what are you doing? They had like 85 millimeter lens. I looked at 35 millimeter days, you know? Uh, that's like here. And I'm going, oh, my God. Sam Waterston off camera. He's doing off camera for me. I said, you know what? I, got, I just put all of it out. I had my words down, locked. And I did three takes. And I went to the great Sam Waterston. And, and after we, we, we shut it down, all right, let's go home. I said, Sam. I said, was that okay? He goes like this. I'll never forget this. He goes, yeah. Yeah, three times. Yeah, I went. Oh man, thank God I put myself in the moment and, and blessed enough to be around a brilliant actor like Sam. 
you know, so, so get right in that moment, capture that. And it's a, it's a great release. It's, it, I'm telling you what, uh, we don't, we don't need, as, as actors and entertainers, you really don't need therapy. <laughs> get on stage. Am I right, Liz? Come on. I totally hear you. I totally hear you. So Joe, this has been amazing. I, we are coming to the end of our time, which is just oh. beautiful. Where can, tell, tell us just really quickly about your amazing radio show and where people can tune into that. Yeah, uh, right, AM 970, and we do it now with that word quarantine, whatever we're doing, I've lost track, but we do a radio show, it's a political talk show, AM 970, and it skews, uh, you know, it's politics, mostly politics, but we talk to everybody, and we have a ball doing it. We have a lot of fun, so AM 970, the answer in the morning, uh, Joe Piscopo, uh, uh, .us, uh, online, uh, we are revamping that because I was going, Liz, I was going out every weekend and now they postponed everything to the fall. So you got to come see a live show because the live show is fun. Plus we're doing films, a film called Joey Benefit about a guy who can't say no to charities. We parallel my life. I, you know, you got a charity. I got a tuxedo. I come early. I stay late. I'm Joey Benefit. So, th so we're doing a lot of things uh, and I'm just having a ball doing it. But I've got to tell you, it's the New York Film Academy. I'm honored to be here. With a shout out to my friend, Colonel Jack Jacobs, who said, you want to talk to Liz? And I'm, I'm honored and flattered to be here because, uh, you know, what, what you do is the real deal. You know, and you, it's a fine reputation. And to reach out to someone like myself, I'm, I'm very humbled to be here today. So thank you, Liz. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. It's been beautiful. And thank you, New York Film Academy, for uh, continuing to present the 2020 series. And everyone, stay safe, be healthy. Bye. Bye, Liz. Thanks for watching. See you on the road. You too. <laughs>